Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, today we're going to react to funny Aussie convert story to Islam. I personally lived over two years in Australia and I can attest that Aussies indeed most of the time are very, very funny people. So I'm looking forward to see this funny convert story from an Australian citizen to Islam. Let's have a look. Um, basically, my, my story begins uh, in first year university. Um, I had a year where I think a lot of problems happened to me. Uh, my parents separated that year. My dog died. That was a particularly tough day. Um, <laughs> subhanAllah. Uh, I had two car accidents in the space of one week. Um, and also, sadly, I had a friend pass away that year. I think that year led me to sort of ask some questions along the lines of why am I here? Why? What's the purpose of life? Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I even bother? Why don't I just sit on the couch, watch TV, Jerry Springer, whatever? And I think I started to ask questions about, you know, the purpose of life. And that led me to start to do a bit of a holy quest. Naturally, as an Aussie, the first thing I did was investigate Christianity. Um, I had a few Christian, Christian friends and um, I remember going to a church camp. It was one of the funniest uh, camps I've ever been to in my life. Everybody was singing. I didn't know what the words were. I didn't know what they were saying. It sounded great. They had beautiful voices, but uh, it just seemed really strange. And everybody was telling me how much God loved me. And I was thinking, God loves me? My dog died. <laughs> SubhanAllah. <laughs> so I kept on investigating Christianity and I went to a whole lot of, um, I guess, different aspects of Christianity. So we're talking about Catholicism. Uh, we're talking about Anglican, Baptist, you know, priests, pastors. And every time I'd go there and ask questions, I'd find that they wouldn't pick up the Bible and start to say, oh, this is the answer, my dear brother. They would just start answering me. They would just answer from their own opinions. And I started to realize that there was a lot of... Yes, I can absolutely relate to this. Unfortunately, within Christianity, you get a lot of vague responses. In Orthodoxy, you have more direct responses, but even there, there is a lot of wiggle room and it is not not as dogmatic as you would believe. Of course, they have certain aspects that will not change, that have no room for interpretation, but certain questions will get answered with different opinions, with vague answers, with interpretations of this or that church father. Islam, on the other hand, is very, very different here. No matter what your question is, you will get 99% of the time a direct straight answer. Interpretations of, of Christianity, and a lot of people had their own interpretations, and one priest yep. from one church was believing one particular aspect of Christianity whilst another was proclaiming another. 100%. So I started to think to myself, the Bible is one text, but there seems to be so many different interpretations and it was confusing. Um, at the time, while I was in first year university, I was also working in a service station, one of my part-time jobs. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues was a Hindu, was an Indian Hindu. And uh, we'd regularly change shift and uh, at that time I was very inquisitive and I'd say to him, Dude, what's the deal with the elephant head guy? You know, what, what's the deal with that, you know? <laughs> Why has that guy got an elephant head? And he's going, yep. oh, that's Ganesha, you know, this, this. I said, we couldn't have chosen like a lion's head or some, something a bit better. We'd have, you know, these real, really deep theological debates while people were buying petrol. Yeah, it's truly funny, man. If you look at Ganesha, the way that I understood the story is that his head got cut off and then his father needed to replace it with something. And so he chooses an elephant head. Of course, this is absolutely funny, but moreover, how does a god get his his head cut off. <laughs> and I'd be saying, yeah, but why bring five bucks of gas tanks, mate? Yeah, no problems. And uh, again, I, I found that that was very hard to stomach. So I sort of investigated a little bit further. I went into, I had a, a good friend of mine was a Mormon. Um, and I found that this religion actually appealed to me the most out of all of the Christian religions, the, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints. They were quite strict. Um, they don't drink uh, alcohol. Um, they, they don't drink caffeine. So unfortunately, Coke's out, guys, because I know Levos love Coke. <laughs> um, but uh, again, you know, there was that leap of faith I felt that I had to make to, to embrace this religion. And I found that, you know, I wasn't just into making a leap of faith. I wanted proof. I also investigated Judaism, would you believe? 
Um, and my original name before Abu Bakr is Reuben. So if you've probably seen all the movies, you've seen Reuben Stein. At the end, they probably thought I was Jewish. So they thought, oh, this guy's, you know, one of us. But again, you know, I, I just didn't find what I, what I was looking for. Um, lastly, I probably looked into Buddhism and I found that this was probably the, Interesting. the religion that I was going to choose. I thought, look, this is great. You know, there's, um, there's so much, uh, you know, people, people at peace here, they seem to be really switched on um, and they seem to be living one with the world and that's what really appealed to me. But the more and more I looked into it, I guess I realised that it wasn't a religion of God, it was just a nice way to live. Um, one of my friends... Yeah, pretty much, man. It is much more lifestyle than a religion. It is focused on the now. It is focused on a being. It is focused on enlightenment theology, but it's not focused on God. Quite the opposite. There is no God within Buddhism. One of my, my close friends, who's a Christian, um, would you believe, said, tell me the religions that you've investigated. So I went through them. I said, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, da da da, da. He goes, what about Islam? Islam? I get they're terrorists. I'm not going to investigate that religion. They're crazy. Why would I even look at that religion? But lo and behold, I found myself walking into a mosque one day. This is my eternal quest. So I walked straight in, shoes on, straight across the prayer rug. There was a brother praying. I walked straight in front of him. As he went to go into sojourn, I almost stepped on his head. Subhanallah, I didn't have any clue what I was doing. I looked over and I saw this brother, you probably know this guy, and this is Abu Hamza, he's come here and he's lectured a few times. Um, SubhanAllah, I call him Abu Dan because uh, he's got a very large beard, mashallah. He came walking out towards me and I thought, today I'm about to die. This is the last day of my life. I'm a dead man. I'm a white boy in Leblayant. What am I going to do here? I'm dead. He came walking across as though he just walked out of the Sahara Desert. Big abaya, big beard. But subhanAllah, the first words he said were, G'day mate, how you going? <laughs> Aussies, if mate. he had the can of VB, it would have been perfect. <laughs> subhanAllah, I was very taken aback by his, uh, by his welcoming nature. Um, as Aussies, I guess now, I don't want to offend any Australians here, but my, my upbringing is from a, a country upbringing. Um, my parents raised me as an atheist. They were raised as Christians. They were dragged along to church every Sunday, and they hated every minute of it. So as soon as we were born, they drummed it into our heads that when you die, you're worm food. That's it. There's no afterlife. There's no God. It's all rubbish. So I was raised as, a, as an atheist. So when I walked across and, uh, and, and I, I saw Abu Hamza and he was It's strange for me to um, see, man. Many Westerners, many white Westerners, be it Aussies, be it Englishmen, be it French people, be it Germans, they grew up atheist. And for me, as somebody from the Balkan, growing up in Germany, it was the strangest thing that the parents of the other kids wouldn't believe in God. In a very polite fashion, which I was very thankful for because I was sure I'd seen him on the five o'clock news hijacking a plane the day before. <laughs> are hospitable, don't get me wrong, but Lebos are the most hospitable people I've ever come across. And as the brother Hamza was saying, these brothers were making me cups of tea, you know, and I honestly needed to keep going to the toilet every five minutes. They just kept putting tea in front of me, biscuits. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like it. And I think to some degree I kept coming back for the biscuits, but also for the religion. <laughs> So when I sat down with these brothers, I actually started asking questions. I asked all the questions that I've asked of, uh, of the, the priests, of the pastors, of, um, of my friends. And subhanAllah, the, the thing that really struck me is that every time I asked the question, they wouldn't just answer. They would pick up a Qur'an and they would say, read this bro, read this. And there was the answer, every single time. And I would ask another question. Yep, this was very amazing to me as well. As I said in the beginning of the video, in Islam, 99% of the time you get a clear-cut answer. You know, you know, the hard questions, not the easy questions. Why do women have to wear the scarf? Why, why the, the hijab? How come I can have four wives and she can't have four husbands? You know, I wanted to know all the tough questions, which is the first questions I guess you ask when, uh, when you come across Islam. 
But lo and behold, they kept on answering the questions with the Qur'an, not from their own opinion. And I got frustrated with this. And I actually said to one of the brothers, because by this stage I'd, I think I'd been going there for about a couple of weeks, there was always a few brothers there when I went. And I said to one of the brothers, I said, you know, what's your opinion on the matter? Why won't you give me your opinion? And one of the brothers turned to me one day and said, how can I have an opinion when this is the word of God? SubhanAllah, I remember that really hit me. So I asked them if I could take a Qur'an home. And I didn't say I was going to use it to chalk up the couch or anything like that. I said I was going to respect the book. So they, I took it home. I started reading it. Um, what I found was, while reading it, it wasn't as though I was reading a story. It was though I was reading someone commanding me, you know, someone giving me guidance. And uh, one night I decided to really try and get the spiritual mood happening. And I'm sure you, probably some of you have heard this story before, so I apologise. Um, I'd lit a candle. <laughs> I had the window open, I had the curtains drawn, you know, I was trying to get that really spiritual feeling. It was a nice summer night in Melbourne, as summer as it can get in Melbourne. And uh, I was sitting there thinking, this is it, you know, this is the night. I'd been, you know, investigating all the spiritual proofs, all the scientific proofs about the fact that the mountains are the pegs, about, you know, how, how the, the embryo develops inside, the, you know, the woman, all these amazing proofs, but I still needed that little push. It's like I was on the edge of a cliff, I was ready to jump, I just needed to push. So I was sitting there, it was very quiet. I was reading Quran and I stopped. I said, Allah, this is my moment. This is the time I'm about to jump into Islam. All I need is just a sign. Just a little sign, nothing huge, maybe a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Maybe half the house could fall down or something, you know, just, just small. It's small for you, man. You, you created the earth. Come on. So I sat there. I was waiting for the candle to start lighting up to four metres high like in the movies. And I go, OK, go. And subhanAllah, nothing. Absolutely nothing happened. I was really disappointed, to be honest. So I sat there and I said, Allah... This is your chance. I'm here. I'm not going nowhere. I'll give you another chance. Okay, maybe you're busy. You know, I know it's daytime over the other side of the world. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Maybe this time it could just be like a car backfiring. You know, something small. All right, the half the house, the candle. Let's forget that. A bird could fart outside. I don't care. Just anything. So I said, okay, go. SubhanAllah, absolutely nothing happened. And I mean, I couldn't have even said, oh, that was it. That, that creep just then in the wall, that was it. Absolutely nothing happened. I was really disappointed. I was gutted. I, I was sitting there thinking, this is it, you know. This was my last chance, Islam. And, and I really, I haven't found it. I pulled back the Qur'an. I, I turned back to where I was reading. SubhanAllah, the very next verse on the next page. For those of you who ask for signs, have we not shown you enough already? Look around you. Wow, man. Look at the stars. Look at the sun. That's a goosebump look moment. Look at the water. These are the signs for the people of knowledge. Wow. SubhanAllah. I threw the doona over my head and I, I pretended I was asleep. I was that scared because I couldn't believe how arrogant I'd been to want my own specific sign when all the signs had been there for me all along. The fact that we have this world, the fact that there is this creation, these are the signs for all of us. This reminds me of a meme that I once saw of an atheist sitting in nature and asking God for a sign. And he's sitting there for 24 hours, seeing the sun rise, the sun down, seeing all of the beauty of nature and still asking God for a sign. The next day I decided this is it, I'm becoming a Muslim. I've been investigating uh, Islam now for probably about six months, to be honest. I went in and I said to myself, this is it, I'm going to make sure that I had no idea what I had to say, I had no idea what the words were. It was probably close to Isha prayer, so it would have been, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, I went in and, and I couldn't believe it, there was about a thousand people at the mosque. I thought, subhanAllah, look at this religion. Look at how strong they are. It was the first night of Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> 
But nevertheless, Ramadan or not, if you look at the state of churches at the moment of Christianity, you will of course see way, way fuller mosques. So therefore to say that the Muslims are stronger than the Christians at the moment would be still correct. The Muslims. So I sat there and I was very nervous, I must admit. I got up and this person's going to me, you got to say these words, bro, Ash Hadu. I'm going, what? Ash what? <laughs> Can't I just say it in English? Now they say, no, you got to say it in Arabic. And I thought, looked at over the sea of beards that I could see in front of me and I thought, if I get these words wrong, I'm a dead man. Again, I had this fear, you know? And they were staring at me and I don't know if you know this, but Australians can't stare. Lebanese people can stare. <laughs> so I was sitting there, I was very scared. I got up and subhanAllah, as soon as I started to say the words, all fear went out of my mind. It felt as though a shower was inside my head and someone had just turned on the cold tap. It felt like I'd been flushed clean. I said the words and I wasn't expecting so many brothers to come up and yell Takbir Allahu Akbar and start kissing me and hugging me. Now I'd never been kissed by that many men in my life. <laughs> But it was a beautiful day, I must admit. And that day was the day that I had more brothers than I could ever uh, ever imagine, more sisters as well. But um, I guess since that day I've never looked back. My family, I think, initially were very worried that uh, I was going to be, I guess, a little bit weird towards them. That they thought that I was going to break out the AK-47s and the grenades. <laughs> Uh, but they realized, I think, soon that, that this religion was actually making me a better person. Prior to Islam, you're not going to believe it, I had a mohawk. <laughs> I did. I had, uh, I'm not going to show you any photos. Um, I had army greens. I had the Metallica t-shirt. I had the cherry docks. I was shocking, right? I thought I looked great, but I looked terrible. And alhamdulillah, ever since then, I look as good as I do now. No, don't laugh, please. <laughs> But my parents were the first people to actually say to me once, which really um, amazed me. They said, my father actually asked me for the Qur'an recently, which I was really happy about. Um, I always thought he'd be one of the hardest people to, to work on. But uh, he said to me, ever since you've been a Muslim, you've been a better person. You're more reliable. <laughs> I can count on you to come and pick me up if my car breaks down. Whereas before I got that, I was drinking last night. I don't know if it's still out of my system. <laughs> Alright guys, and this is it for today's video. Definitely a funny story, a classical funny Aussie delivery here reminded me of my time living in Australia. This is how I got to know the Australian people. They always like to joke, they always like to have a good time. That being said, for me personally, it is very, very interesting to see other Westerners that have converted to Islam. He said that he researched Islam for roughly six months before he converted. I personally have researched Islam for roughly two years by now, and I'm still digging deep into the religion, still trying to understand it fully or at least as much as I can. Why that is, I already explained plenty of times, but I'm aware that not everybody watches my live streams, not everybody got the memo. During my lifetime, I explored many, many different ideologies, different religions, different substances, different spiritual practices, different sports even, all kinds of different fields where I dive deep head first into the subject matter and accepted it as the ultimate truth. Just then to realize a few years later that it wasn't the truth at all. And this is why mainly I haven't converted to Islam. People ask me, what else do you need to know about Islam? Guys, honestly, it's not really about Islam. I do not even have so many questions left when it comes down to Islam. There are certain things, small things, but that's not the main point. It's not about Islam. It's about myself. It is about knowing myself and understanding what I've done in the past. For example, when I went vegan, I jumped into veganism, accepted it as the truth, and I stuck with it for four years straight. Now I'm anti-vegan. I hate veganism. I would never recommend veganism to anybody quite the opposite but if i rewind now and i look at myself at the beginning of my veganism i was a completely different person i was somebody that accepted veganism as the truth i believe that i found the truth by looking into slaughterhouse footage into industrial farming and i believe that i can never unsee this this is what the vegans claimed once you see the truth you can never unsee this but then i looked further into it i researched further into it and i found out how how flawed it is, how wrong it is, how bad it is for our health, how bad it is for the environment, etc., etc., you name it. And the point of the story.
story is that I do not want this to happen to Islam. Therefore, I have to urge you yet again, this is not only about myself, speaking in general, if you see people on YouTube that are researching Islam, you shouldn't push them into it because they truly have to make the decision in their heart and they truly have to be secured in their decision. I heard some numbers, I do not know how true they are, about the 50% dropout rate of new converts. That means that 50%, half of the people that converted to Islam will drop out of Islam. And this is definitely not a good look for the religion either. If you look at the Catholic Church, what they are doing at the moment is absolutely outrageous. They're opening the doors for everybody, even for the L community. Why do they do it? Because they want more members in the church. But this is not the right approach. If you want more members, those members, if they are weak, will destroy the whole movement. Therefore, you should be much more selective by recruiting people to Islam. The people that enter Islam must have such a firm conviction, such a strong conviction that they do not leave the religion, but rather become strong representatives of that religion. And this is why I'm taking my time. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave the thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel via Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Moreover, guys, I have to repeat it one more time. Over 70% of my viewers are not subscribed. So please do me the favor, subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell as well. All right, guys, but this is it. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.